morning, church. How is everybody this morning? Got one, one clapper over here, two. How's everybody feeling this morning? Let's stand up, raise our voices, let's worship the Lord this morning. I'm coming with the heart of worship. I'm bringing in a brand new song. I'm ready to see the anthem. for a fresh encounter souls looking to the living God I'm ready for a real revival oh Holy Spirit come like a flood like a fire Holy Spirit fall in this place fill our hearts Holy Spirit come like a flood like a fire Holy
Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here at Life Point Church. A couple weeks ago, I attended a funeral with Pastor Rusty, and he took us to John chapter 11. Now, John 11 has to do with three individuals that the Bible calls Jesus' friend. Now, imagine that. Not the fact that I want to be Jesus' friend. The fact that Jesus wants to be my friend is mind-blowing. Knowing what I know about me, amen? So you know the story. Martha and Mary send the message to Jesus. He that you love is very sick. In John 11, 14 and 15, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. I wonder why he said that. To the intent ye may believe. I mean, we've seen Jesus walk on water. We've seen Jesus allow Peter to walk on water. Amen? Let's keep reading. In John eleven twenty one, 21, it says, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, Martha leaves Jesus, goes to find Mary, and lets her know that the Savior is here and is calling for her. So in John eleven thirty two, 32, it says, when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, that's amazing to me. The fact that they both said the same thing. Now, either they had been rehearsing that before Jesus ever got there, or the Holy Spirit put that in their mouth to orchestrate something. Because Jesus wasn't just standing there to hear them. His disciples were there. So that generations upon generations, thousands of years later, we could come and learn a tremendous lesson here. Now, what's famous for being the most shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five 35 says, Then Jesus wept. Now, I realize why Jesus wept. Jesus weeps because there will be believers that won't be in place, and people will die not knowing Jesus. He doesn't weep for the one he will raise. He weeps for what Martha was saying and for what Mary was saying. He said, it's a good thing I wasn't there because I'm going away and I'm leaving this in y'all's hands, and I want you to know the weight of this. I want you to know that you have to stay in the word and you have to stay in prayer because people could perish if you are unwilling to share the good news. Let me pray. Everybody stay seated. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to come and worship you, be in your house. May you be with everybody in this building. May you bless everybody in this building and their households. In Jesus' name, amen. For the next few minutes, we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. I'm reminded. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So when we take the Lord's Supper, it's a chance for us to think about our walk with God, think about where we are with God, think about the times we disappointed Him, the things that might have said or not said, things that might have done or not done. It's not about worrying about what somebody else has done or not done. But a chance for us to reflect and say, God, you love me. And I'm reminded today that you died on the cross for me so that I could be forgiven. So that I could have eternal life. It's not about how good I am, but how good he is. It's not about how faithful I am, but how faithful he is. So I'm going to pray for this. Bread and this wine. Grape juice. As we take it, let us reflect on what God has done for us. I'm going to read you a few scriptures. We'll take this together. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for your body that was broken for us, for your blood that was shed for us. God, we are so thankful that we have redemption through your blood, the forgiveness of our sins. So God, today, each one of us come before you confessing our sins. God, knowing that you forgave us a long time ago on that cross, but God, we want you to know that you know. We know that you know. And God, we're sorry. God, help us to live a better life for you. One that would be pleasing and honorable to you. One that would reflect you to other people. God, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Paul wrote these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
Take it. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. He says in verse 26, For whenever you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're we're just proclaiming his love and his forgiveness for us. Amen. His forgiveness for the world. If only they too would believe. It said that night they went out with singing in their hearts, praising God and worshiping God. And I don't know about you, but I came to church this morning to just lay my heart out before God and worship him. If you want to, please stand with us right now as we continue this worship time.
as he gets that switched around. So how many of you in this room can, without a shadow of a doubt, know your name is registered in heaven? Amen. Isn't that awesome? It's meant to be opened, explored, pursued. It's made to be read, reread, applied, and used. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, with wisdom life changing to lead us on. It's made for guidance to teach us His ways, showing what's true, right, and worthy of praise. It's meant to be hidden, deep in our hearts, daily examined as the morning starts. 
No greater glimpse of God do we have. A lamp to our feet and a light to our path. about how we live in a world today where people say you believe what you want, I believe what I want, don't tell me what to believe and I won't tell you what to believe. Uh, there seems to be no absolute truth. Uh, it's another reason why I think Christianity is uh, uh, so fought against. Uh, you know, we, we claim that, that there is only one way to heaven, right? Uh, that is our claim. And, uh, John chapter 14, verse 6, it says, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by Him. It makes us very unpopular with every other known world religion because we believe Jesus is the way. So we live in this world that, that wants to say that it's okay for us to coexist, that there's multiple avenues. We, we even have bumper stickers that say coexist. Uh, we, we, we have this... This, this hard thing where we have a, you know, the Bible says in the end times, people will heed to those that will teach them the things that they want to hear, right? Like sometimes we don't get the answer we want, so we go somewhere else to try to get the answer. We, we ask someone for their opinion, and when they don't tell us what we want to hear, we'll ask someone else for their opinion. And the reality is that there is an absolute truth. God's word is true. How do I know, Rusty? How can I trust it? As is truth. Angie and I had this crazy thing happen. We went with uh, Kyle yesterday. Uh, we got to go to a soccer game, uh, the Sporting KC. I don't know if you've ever been to one of those games. It was fun. They were chanting. It was crazy. Um, we, we were playing against St. Louis. St. Louis was ranked number one. Sporting KC was ranked number 11. We won. And those guys that were from St. Louis right behind me, they were all hyped when they made the first goal. And whenever we got ahead, they, we didn't hear nothing. It was, it was crazy. But before we got to go in there, it was over at the Legends area, my favorite store on the planet. This is going to surprise you probably, but I love Nebraska Furniture Mart. And so we were going by it, and I will look for a reason to buy something there. It doesn't have to take very much for me. And I've got a little rip in my chair, my easy chair at home. And so I told Angie, I'm like, hey, my birthday's tomorrow. And thank you. And I'm going to be 48. Thank you. Thank you. Go on. No, I'm kidding. But I'm going to be 48. And I told her, I said, man, I need a chair. And so we go in there, and I gravitate. I am high maintenance. I gravitate to the expensive stuff, and I don't know how that happens, but if you, how many of y'all have been furniture shopping in a, like the last year? Okay, I haven't. It's been a while, and inflation happened to the furniture market. Bad. And so I get in there, and I mean, like, it's crazy, but I gravitate in front of the TV section. There was this really cool, luxurious leather couch. It was beautiful. I sat down on that thing, and it just sucked me right in. It was, a, it was a, uh, um, a sectional, and it had automatic, it was awesome. And, and my neck was a little pinched, and Angie goes, they got automatic headrest things, too. You hit a button, and it's like, and I'm like, this, this is nice. Like, oh, I'm like, how much is this, dude? And she looks at it. She, she had to tag down there by her leg. She looks at it. She goes, get off the couch. <laughs> Me and Kyle jump up. I'm like, what? She's like, you don't even want to know how much this couch is. I'm like, what? I'm expecting $5,000. I'm like, I'm good with that. I'll pay for the next 35 years. $5,000, no problem. <laughs> they got me. <laughs> she said, try again. Is that? Kyle said, $7,000. She said, try again. I'm like, whatever. You're not reading this thing right. She said it's $17,000. I know, me too. I was like, I was like, does this thing have wheels and a motor? Can you drive it? Uh, I'm like, I was just a Bass Pro and they had a boat for $17,000. Are you kidding me? And I was just blown away. And I said, you're reading that wrong. And she spun that tag around so I could see it was like $17,240 some dollars. I was like, I guess you can read. <laughs> that was amazing. She was telling me it was the truth. 
And it was hard for me to accept it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I could not believe that a couch would cost that much money. This morning, I want to give you some encouragement how we can know that the Bible is God's word, that it's true, that it's trustworthy. If you've got your Bibles, open them up to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. We're going to have some fun this morning, but more importantly, I want to give you some ammo when you come in contact with somebody that says they just don't believe. I, I've met people recently that grew up in church that told me they just quit believing in God, and I, I want to address that a little bit as we go today, but, but here we go. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says this about the Word of God, for the Word of God is alive and active. It's alive and active. I remember uh, the first time um, God's word rocked my world, really rocked my world. I was 15 years old, sitting out in the congregation. A guy was preaching, and as he was preaching, I could feel a stirring inside of me that I can't explain any other way than like a guilty conscience. Like that day, I knew from listening to the word of God that I haven't given my life to Jesus, that if if I were to perish, if I were to die, that I wasn't going to spend eternity with Jesus in heaven, but Jesus wanted me to spend heaven with him. He created heaven for us to be there with him. And so I had this drawing going on in me. Uh, The Bible says it in Revelation chapter 3, 20, that behold, I stand at your heart's door and I knock, and if a man would... Open up his heart's door. I would come in and fellowship with him. Uh, It says in John chapter 6 verse 44 that no one can come to the Father unless the Father who sent me draws him. There is a drawing that takes place. God's word is active. It's living. It's alive. It's not dead. His word is alive. How do we know? The Bible says in John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was God and nothing was created except by him. That's Jesus, the living word of God. We've got this living word of God that's the same today as it always will be. From the beginning of time to the end of time, it will never fade away, the Bible says. It is active. It is alive. And then he goes on, he says here in Hebrews 4.12, it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to divide soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitude of the heart. In other words, God's word has a way of piercing and getting all the way to the core of a person. Isn't that exciting? That God's word is that strong. If you were here a few Sundays back, I blew up a potato. Y'all remember that? Hit the back wall. I, somebody told me I should have microwaved those first and got them softer. But I'm like, man, we hit the back wall already. What more do you want? I love blowing stuff up. But in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says that the gospel, that's the word of God, is the power unto salvation for those who would believe, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For all of us that would believe, it is the power, that's the gospel, that's the word. It is powerful. The word power here in the Greek is the word dynamis, and dynamis is where we derive the word dynamite. That kind of power, the word of God is so powerful. It's going to disrupt our whole way of thinking. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says this. It says, consequently, faith comes by hearing the word and the word of God, right? It says it this way in the NIV. Faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. The big idea this morning is you can trust in the power and the accuracy of God's word, of the scripture, When seeking answers about God's word, there's three things that I want to consider this morning. The first two are going to go pretty quick, and the last one I'm going to spend a little more time on. The first one is this, consider the historical accuracy of God's word. There is not one book that has more historical accuracy, more evidence of its historical accuracy than the word of God. While the autographs or the original manuscripts of the Bible have not survived the ravages of time, no other book from ancient world has more earlier or more accurate copied manuscripts than the Bible. For example, we have 25,000 to 30,000 handwritten manuscripts of the New Testament. Nearly 5,800 of them in Greek, and none of these challenge a single doctrine or a belief of the Christian faith. The scribes, the 40 men who penned the scriptures over a period of 1,500 years, they insisted that their message came from God. Many were persecuted or even martyred for their faith, and the authors of the Bible claimed to be under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Look what it says in 2 Peter 1, verse 20. 
Above all, you must understand that no prophecy or scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You know, in the old days, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the early days, God spoke to us through his prophets in endeavorous places and endeavorous ways. That's like Moses in the burning bush. But in these last days, he spoke, spoke to us through his son, the living word. Living, active word of God, right? These days now, you hear people comment that the pastor's a prophet. Uh, you know, the Bible says about prophecy in Deuteronomy, it says that a prophet has to be 100% accurate 100% of the time. If they say, thus saith the Lord, then the Lord better have said it. Amen? Uh, the only time I claim prophecy, I see prophecy in modern day as preaching in modern day and only preaching the word of God. Y'all hear me? If I preach the word of God, I can be confident that the word of God is 100% accurate 100% of the time. That it is useful. Listen, he says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 through 17, that all scripture is God-breathed, that it was, it was uh, inspired by God. It is useful for correcting and rebuking and training in all righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped unto every good work. Further, even non-Christian ancient writings attest to the truthfulness of the eyewitness accounts of Christ Jesus. The second thing I want you to see today is examine fulfilled prophecy. We consider the fulfilled prophecies that we have throughout the Bible. Again, I told you they have to be 100% accurate 100% of the time. If we consider the Old Testament prophecies, the last of which dates more than four centuries before the birth of Jesus. Jesus fulfills every messianic prophecy except those pertaining to his glorious return because we know that he's yet to return, right? Right? Remember his words in John chapter 14, verse 3. This is one about his return. It says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. That where I am, you will be also. I love it. He's told us all these other things and they've come true. Why would we not believe this one as well? Jesus fulfilled 61 prophecies in his birth alone. And, and there's many critics, there's many uh, scholars that believe that Jesus fulfilled at least 300 prophecies in his earthly ministry. Now, I'm no mathematician, but the probability of a person fulfilling even one prophecy is one to the 17th power. In other words, if you put one up and put 17 zeros behind it, that's the probability. Reminds me of Dumb and Dumber. Y'all remember whenever he said, so you think I got a chance? That girl said, you got one in a million. This is one to the 17th power. Experience, uh, here's the third thing, and I want to spend time with this one. Uh, consider experiencing the transformational power of God. John chapter 8, 31 through 32 says this, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I love this, that he's talking to the Jews because the Jews did not believe in the beginning that Jesus was the Messiah. There are still Orthodox Jews that do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but those that have trusted in him, he's changed their life. Y'all remember a guy named Saul? That was his Hebrew name and his Greek name is Paul. He wrote like nine books to some say 13 books of the New Testament. And the reality is that Paul went and spread the gospel all across the world because of the change that happened in his life on the road to Damascus. Jesus got a hold of him. He was transformed by the power of the living word of God, his son Jesus. And Jesus says here, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You know, the Old Testament talks about ten, ten laws. It talks about another 613 laws in Leviticus. It was really hard to, 
to follow all of these laws, to be a righteous person. Matter of fact, it was so hard that God knew that this wasn't the way to salvation. He planned before the foundation of the earth to allow his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins and for my sins, that only Jesus could pay the debt for you and me. Because the Bible says he was tempted in every way, yet he was without sin. Some of us in religion, we've experienced people putting more on us than what even the Word of God says. Last week, I told you guys about I got in trouble when I was in third grade. I won a break dancing contest. Y'all remember me talking about? My dad was the Baptist preacher at First Baptist Church, Morton, Texas. I'll never forget it. He brought me in the living room. He sat me down. He said, son, Baptists don't believe in dancing. I said, well, if I find out someday it's okay to dance, I'll be mad at somebody. I remember telling dad, David danced before the Lord, Daniel danced before the Lord, and one of them danced naked before the Lord. I wasn't even naked. Like, I remember when churches would say, you can't play cards. You know, I want to look at the scripture, I go, that's not what the scripture says. We, we, we don't need to put more on each other. What we need to do is say, we just need to be who God wants this to be, this transformational power of the word of God. He says, then you will know if you remain in, in his teaching, if you hold to my teaching, in other words, if you read the scripture, the word of God, if you follow the word of God, the, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You know, there was eyewitnesses that experienced that transformational power of God and his word, even in the Old Testament. I think about Moses in the burning bush. Can you remember, like that day, Moses was up there on top of the mountain and he sees a bush on fire and it's not being consumed. And then he hears a voice from the bush. That would freak me out. Amen? Uh, he experienced a transformational happening through God. David and Goliath. I think about David and Goliath. I, I remember how David, you know, he was gangster, right? Like he come up in there and he was, he was like, yo, Saul, I killed a bear with my bare hands. I killed a lion with my bare hands. This Philistine be like one of those. I can't help it, but when he gets out there on that line and he sees how big this nine foot tall giant is, he had to be like, mm -hmm. but we don't read that. We read that he experienced the transformational power that can only happen through an encounter with the living God. Daniel and the lion's den. Whenever Daniel's cast in the lion's den, he's got to think on his way in there that he's going to get eaten up only to have God shut the mouths of the lions. And I'm sure they were like big kittens just purring all over him. I mean, I can only picture he's just like petting on them. He's like, hey, what's up, guys, when they come to check on him the next day. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the transformation that happened in the middle of that and, and the king looks in there and he sees four guys walking around. He says one of them looks like the son of man. And then when they go and pull them guys out, they didn't even smell like fire. They didn't smell like smoke or nothing. The apostle stories of what they witnessed in the transformational power of Jesus and the word of God. Whenever they walked with Jesus, he said, come follow me. And they followed him and they see Jesus feed the 5,000 with just two fish and five loaves of bread. That would be like, whoa. And then they see Jesus put some dirt and mud together, rub it in a guy's eyes, told him to go wash. The guy comes back seeing. He says, I once was blind, now I can see. Uh, they saw Jesus on the day that it was, a, it was a Sabbath day. and They brought a man in there with a withered hand and Jesus told him to stretch forth his hand. And the Bible says that his hand became whole. They saw it grow. They were there the day that Martha and Mary cried out. Our brother died. And if you would have been here, he might not have died. They were there. Jesus said, roll the stone away. And then he shouted in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man, the Bible says, came out of the tomb. They saw that transfer. Try to tell one of them God didn't show up. Try to tell them there's no power in the blood. These guys... They experienced the transformational power of God and they stood by it at the cost of their own lives. You see, people have been known 
for centuries to die for something they truly believed in. But it is rare and exceptional to die for something one knows to be alive, a lie. Listen to this, St Stephen, he stoned to death as the first Christian martyr. Herod Agrippa kills James with a sword. Peter is crucified reportedly upside down on an X-shaped cross in Rome. Matthew was beheaded in Ethiopia. Mark dies in Egypt after horses drag him through the streets of Alexandria. Luke is hanged in Greece as a result of his preaching. Andrew is crucified in Greece. Thomas is thrust through with pine spears, tormented with red-hot plates, and burned alive in India. Philip is tortured and then crucified in Phry Phrygia. Uh, James the Great... Son of Zebedee is beheaded in Jerusalem. Nathaniel, or, or Bartholomew, is beat with a whip and then crucified. John is boiled in oil and then exiled to Patmos. And Paul was beheaded in Rome. There are many good reasons to trust the scriptures. In our conversations with those who ask, how do you know the Bible is true? We may confidently respond. I believe the Bible is true because credible eyewitnesses ac accurately recorded the acts of God throughout human history. Under divine direction, free uh, of personal agendas, and in the presence of hostile witnesses who often made them pay for their testimonies with their lives. These eyewitnesses, they were incredible. Though they all fell short sometime or another. I think about Peter whenever he denied Christ three times. He told Jesus, I will never deny you. I will die for you. And Jesus said before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Only to see that in John, thank goodness, John chapter 21, Jesus meets up with him again after he was buried, uh, uh, rose again, and then began to show himself before his ascension for 40 days uh, to over 500 eyewitnesses. One of those accounts was this time when he uh, says to them, they're out on the water and they haven't caught any fish all night. And Jesus yells from the bank, hey, Friends, have you got any fish? And they said, No. And he says, Cast your net on the other side of the boat. This wasn't the first time they heard this. Amen. Well, it worked last time. We're trying it again. They put it in the water. They still don't know it's Jesus. They catch such a large number of fish, they can hardly haul them to the shore. Somebody says, It's the Lord. And Peter puts his clothes on, jumps in the water, and swims about 100 yards till he gets to where Jesus is. Jesus says, Grab some of that fish you just caught. Bring it on over here. We're having breakfast together. And they sit down there around that fire, and they eat together. And Jesus asked Peter three times, Do you love me? Representing those three times that Jesus knew that he had denied him. All three times, Peter says, you know I love you. He said, feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Feed my lambs. He was restoring Peter when Peter didn't feel like he should be restored. I fall short. I think we all fall short. We can read God's word. We can see God do amazing things in our life, can't we? We can have that transformational power of the Holy Spirit of God through his word. When we talk about times like when I was 15 or another time whenever I was down in Texas and I remember God speaking in that service that day, there was these uh, undeniable times that I felt like God was moving and showing me something in his word. And then I can just fall on my face. I'm struggling right now with a, a thing. I just want to be vulnerable and tell you all about it. Uh, we got asked to be a part of the life chain. I'm against abortion. But I love you. I've had many young ladies come to my office <clears throat> and say, Rusty, I don't know how God could ever forgive me. I had an abortion. Young men that were involved in that, and they did they said, I don't know how I could ever face the Lord. And I want to talk to them about how much Jesus loves them. He cares for them. Yes, he loved those unborn children. Yes, I believe they're with him in paradise today. But I don't want to be like Peter where I'm unashamed, right? And so I asked the guys that were doing life chain, I said, what is this exactly? And they said, well, it's a prayer thing. I said, well, last year I saw people holding signs up. It looked more like a, a protest. And they said, well, it's not supposed to be a protest. We're just wanting to bring people's awareness. And I said, well, I want to be involved if it means that I can tell people I love them. 
If they're getting any other, any other sign there, I, I don't want to be a part of it. I just want to tell them I love them. I want to tell them God loves them. So I was struggling. Like, how do I do this? What's this look like? How, 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 you know, do I, do I make me a sign that just has two holes and I can put it over my head? And I'm standing out there and I'm serving God. You know, I also don't want ever to make the church a political thing. Y'all hear me? I mean, there's Republicans, there's Democrats. I got my, I love my, uh, my mentor. He tells me we're biblicists. If the Bible says it, we're for it. Uh, this pulpit is not to tell somebody to be one of those other things. It's really not to talk about <clears throat> a lot of all the crazy issues. I believe that if we share the gospel of the message of Christ, that it will change lives, and those things will change for the better. Yeah. Amen? But I also want to stand for Jesus publicly. Maybe you'll come with me on October. I think it's the first weekend in October, and we're going to hold signs that say God loves you. That's what that's what I want to tell. I mean, down, down the street, they might see other, but I just want to say God loves you. Maybe you'll stand with me and tell people God loves you. We love you. And we're praying for the unborn. We're praying for those that have been through it. We're praying for those that might be thinking about. Then I think about Zachariah and his dream with Joshua. The high priest... What an illustration the Bible gives us. Through a dream, Zechariah in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. This picture of a courtroom and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? We're all sinners. We're like Joshua, Joshua, though being the high priest, he wants us to see that, you know, the Bible says in, in Romans chapter 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans chapter 3, in the beginning, it says, there is no one righteous, no, not one. We all practice deceit, the poison of vipers is on our lips. Misery and debauchery mark our way in the way of peace. We do not know. So he takes the high priest, the, the guy that's supposed to be the closest to God, and shows him. There and God says to Satan, In this man a burning stick snatched from the fire. You and I were we were headed for a devil's hell, but the day that we accepted Christ into our life, we're like that burning stick snatched from the fire. Now he goes on to say in verse three that Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I put fine garments on you. Then I said, <laughs> this is Zechariah speaking into his dream, Put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. Maybe you're here today and you're standing there like Joshua, dressed in filthy clothes. And the Lord says, see, I've taken away these filthy clothes and I'm going to put clean garments on you. Old Testament says, though your sin be red as scarlet, I shall make them white as snow. When Jesus forgives us, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that uh, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He remembers them no more. When Jesus forgives us, he says, I promise I won't bring it up again. And Zechariah says, man, it's awesome that you cleansed him, that you promised to never bring his sin up again. But, but put a clean turban on his head. In the Middle East, a, a turban, when a man wears a turban, it represents his relationship with God. If you knock his turban off, he has the right to kill you. It's that serious. Zechariah, knowing this, says, don't just forgive his sin. Restore his relationship. Put a new turban on his head. Your life is precious to Jesus. Your life has meaning because of Jesus. You have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, 7, in him, meaning Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. Put a clean turban on his head. 
I believe God wants to restore his relationship with you and me today. Not too long ago, I had that friend of mine tell me, he said, Rusty, we're not going to have fights in the American church today because people, not over theology, because people love and defend a book they don't read. If we want to experience the transformational power of God's word, listen, you can believe God's word because it's historically inaccurate. It fulfills all prophecy as recorded in it. And you can believe it because it has the power to transform your life. Here's the next step this morning. After this preacher snotted all over the thing and spit and screamed and yelled and hollered. And you go, man, whew, what just happened? What I think God wants us to take us home today with is the next step. Try it. Start reading God's word and see what he does in your life today. I dare you. You struggling in your marriage? Get in God's word. People say, well, I got this. I'm not knocking those help books for your marriage. They're great. But the greatest help book you'll ever find is God's word. I'm not, I'm not knocking the book that tells you how to raise your son or your daughter. They're good. But God's word is the best. It's transformational power. It is alive. It is active. There's something about it. I promise you, friend. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. All those infomercials about how to get skinny. I was always going to write one about how to gain weight. Try this for 30 days. Eat peanut butter in a bowl with syrup. Don't move at night. You'll gain 20 pounds in 10 days probably. But I believe if you try God's word, that in less time than that, you're going, to be in a, you're going to begin to experience his transformational power. You will hear him speak to you, probably not audibly, but in that still small voice. And through the pages of the Bible, where he gives us clear and precise direction. Would you try it today? Lord, I love you. God, I thank you and I praise you this day. God, in a world where we live of a broken faith, this busted up faith, God, I pray that we would be strong in ours. That, God, we would know why we believe what we believe. That, God, we would be prepared when somebody asks us for the hope that we have, that we can share with them your love and your guidance through your word. God, I pray for you to change lives, change eternities in this very moment. God, we thank you and we praise you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Would you come today as God leads you right now? Stand with us. This is the time of invitation. You come if you're able. We want to pray for you today. You come, friend. Maybe you'd surrender your life. You come. You are the peace that calms my troubled sea. When the cares of this world darken my day You are the light that shines and shows me the way Oh, the beauty of your majesty On the cross you showed your love to me Beautiful Lord Awesome and mighty I'm captured by this love I see Beautiful Lord Tender and holy Your mercy brings me to my knees It's your mercy that has made me free Beautiful Lord When my sin is all that I can see Your grace remains the shelter that I My weakness is all I can give 
Your gentle spirit gives me strength again Oh, the beauty of your majesty On the cross you showed your love for me Beautiful Lord Awesome and mighty I'm captured by this love I see Beautiful Lord Tender and holy Your mercy brings me to my the beauty of your majesty on the cross you showed your love to me beautiful Lord awesome and mighty I'm captured by this love I see beautiful Lord Ten your mercy brings me to my knees It's your mercy that has made me free Beautiful Lord hey, Amen, you can be seated We're going to take an offering at this time Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, just so thankful for the many blessings that you've given us, Lord. Just multiply this offering for your use and your service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Great to see each and every one of you. Uh, if you didn't pick up a listening guide on the way in, make sure you grab one on the way out. Lots of things going on. Uh, probably the biggest thing right now is we've got the youth starting back up on the 10th. Uh, Savannah will have some more information about that in just a moment. And then our small groups start back up the end of this month. So we'd like to have you be involved with that. Great to see each and every one of you. Let's enjoy this day. What's up, Life Point? We are so glad that you made it today. Before you head out, I have a handful of announcements for you. The first one is September 10th, our youth is starting back up, which is exciting. We are starting back up with a football-themed barbecue. Parents and students invited. Uh, if a parent can't come, students are still encouraged to come kick it off with us. Uh, wear your favorite football gear, prepare for some games. There will be uh, hamburgers and hot dogs provided, but we encourage you all to bring any side dishes or desserts that you'd like to. The second announcement I have for you guys is we have a concert coming up for our students as well. That'll be September 22nd. We'll meet at the church and leave for Lee Summit at 4 p.m. Um, the cost is $25 uh, plus food for dinner. If you'd like to sign up for that, you can head over to our website, go to Connections, and then Students, and there's a sign-up form for you there. Uh, my third announcement for you guys is currently in the month of September, we are doing Kicks for Kids. And during this time, we encourage you guys to bring in and donate new shoes, uh, shoes that you would buy for your kids. Um, so name brand, maybe we want to provide all the students in this area with a new pair of shoes as they're going back to school. The last announcement I have for you is starting next Friday, we are sending a team up to Fulton to prepare their new building. We just bought a new building for our Fulton campus, which is so exciting, yet a lot of work is still to be done. And so if you want to be a part of that team, for the next three months, we'll be meeting every Friday night at 5.30. Uh, and you'll have to bring a cot as well because the work will go into Saturday. But this is a great opportunity for us to go serve our family over at Fulton. Uh, and that's it for today. I pray you guys have an amazing week, and we'll see you again next time.